I was taught 30, 35 years ago in medical school residency to think six steps ahead of before I did anything. Now, I will tell you that makes neurosurgery very different than just about every surgical specialty. Why? Because one, two, three millimeter mistake can lead to drastic complications for the patient. So the precaution principle is a huge factor. And like when I teach people about Bitcoin and Clubhouse, mm -hmm. I always tell them that irrespective of where you are, what country you are, you know, what's going on with the macro situation, owning Bitcoin is employing the precaution principle for your value and your finance. Hello and welcome to Bitcoin with Jake. This is a podcast all about people's personal journeys to Bitcoin. I wanted to know more about the people converging on this new form of money. Why do they see value in it? What skills enable their understanding? How is it changing their lives? If you're a founder looking for funding or an investor looking to make investments, then please reach out as I develop my network in the space. Do me a favor and chuck us a five-star rating on whichever app you're using to listen or a like if you're watching it somewhere. As insignificant as this may seem, they help a startup project like this hugely. Lastly, if you have any questions at all, please just reach out. The easiest place to find me is on Twitter at Jake E. S. Woodhouse. Now, I'd like to take a quick moment to talk about our sponsor. Fast Bitcoins are a Bitcoin exchange who you should definitely take a look at next time you're thinking of making a Bitcoin purchase. They're a great team, which for me is always the key to due diligence, whilst their product has a ton of features useful to every Bitcoiner. Check out my episodes with Danny Brewster, the founder CEO, and Nathan Smith, the chief compliance officer, to learn more about the people behind the brand. Thank you to Fast Bitcoins for sponsoring the show. Now, on to today's episode. I'm very excited to have Dr. Jack Cruz on the show. Hi, Dr. Jack. How are you? Well, it's good to meet you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. So this is a show about Bitcoin and people's personal journeys to Bitcoin. I was I was put in touch with you by one of my listeners, Jalal. So shout out to, to him and thank you for that. What I'd love to learn about is a bit of your backstory, what you do professionally and what lens that gave you on what Bitcoin actually is. And generally speaking, that question will take us in lots of different fascinating directions. So yeah, Dr. Jack, teach me a bit about uh, your journey to Bitcoin, please. Well, I'm a neurosurgeon, board certified neurosurgeon. And you probably remember about the great financial crisis, 2008, 2009, and what happened in the States. At that time, I saw a pretty significant hit, you know, in my neurosurgery business. Why? Because people just didn't have money, so they couldn't pay, you know, their co-pays to get surgeries done. So that was like the first time that I actually, in my long career of medicine, ever saw that finances really interacted with centralized medicine. Because as an allopathic doctor, that technically is centralized medicine. When I say centralized, meaning we practice in a hospital, everything in the hospital is centralized, nothing is decentralized. And um, from that time, I was kind of interested with the two things that were coming up. We would see in the surgeon's lounge all the time about the stuff about Occupy Wall Street and then Occupy Democrats. And I started to realize that a lot of the guys that were in the uh, Occupy Wall Street were cypherpunks. And I was initially turned off to them because their ethos for me about anarchy didn't make any sense. But when they started to talk about money and value and what had just happened you know, with the Wall Street banks and the fact that Geithner and and the rest of them basically bailed out the banks, you know, with tarp money and didn't do anything for people. That's actually what got my attention. And I followed it, you know, from that pathway. Mm -hmm. And from that, you know, that 2011, 2012, we, we get Satoshi Nakamoto. So I was interested in what Nakamoto had said back then. And the thing that I think you'll be really surprised at. I went through a transition myself probably 20 years ago. Centralized medicine is a focus about RNA and DNA. Mm -hmm. I became decentralized because I realized the third genome in a cell was your mitochondrial DNA, and it's all about energy. And it's all about timing, specifically circadian timing. Now, 
back at this time, nobody realized how important circadian biology was for medicine. Then in 2017, five years ago, it was given the Nobel Prize, and it found out that most of the diseases that are out there are tied to problems with mitochondrial DNA. But remember, the focus of the centralized platform is RNA and DNA. You know, that's the reason why big pharma exists. And if you're a doctor long enough like I am over 30 years, you begin to realize that they're expert in creating customers, but not reversing disease. That's what they do. And when I saw that, I started to really pay attention to the ethos around Bitcoin. The thing that really caught my eye when I read the white paper the first time, I think it was eight or nine of the bibliography sites were about talent. And it dawned on me right then and there that the Bitcoin network, the idea that Satoshi Nakamoto had was that Bitcoin was fundamentally a clock. In that sense, it was fully decentralized the way the algorithm was built, but it had a lot in common with circadian biology. And that really, that really caught my attention. Now, at this time, it's right around 2013. Probably the thing that kept me away from Bitcoin early was all the stuff that went on with Mt. Gox. Mm. Uh, but, but I didn't I didn't run away from Bitcoin because of the Mt. Gox thing, because I began to realize that Bitcoin really was a thermodynamic story. And what did I do in my transition 20 years ago? I was teaching people how circadian biology in a decentralized fashion. Remember, the, the controller for cells is light and dark. It's not light and it's not dark. You have to have both together in order to optimize, you know, energy transformation in your mitochondria. And that's when I started to really understand what Satoshi Nakamoto was doing. And I'll I'll explain to you further why that's the case. In circadian biology, light is turned into a DC electric current in our tissues. What does Bitcoin functionally do? It uses electricity to create proof of work mechanism. So it mimics exactly the same thing that a cell is doing with light. And most people understand that electricity, you know, and light have a lot in common. Why, if you run a light through an LED or a semiconductor, you generate light. And that's actually how the clock in your eye works. It's called the supracosmatic nucleus. It sits on your optic nerve. And I told you, I'm a neurosurgeon, so I happen to know quite a bit about this. And I started, you know, to put things together. And when I told you that I realized that Bitcoin and the supercosmonic nucleus had a lot in common. I realized that they both consume energy, they both consume information, and it leads to an organization, a code, not only in the brain and the eye, but also in the Bitcoin alg- algorithm. And mm. the output is value mm. and the ledger, right? at least in Bitcoin. And it turns out we have a ledger in cells that you may not know about. It's called telomeres, actually tell us what the status of the clock is all about. And, you know, Bitcoin makes up its own block time. Mm. You know, it's most commonly known as block height. Mm. Block height allows for Bitcoin to keep track of things. Cells in Bitcoin are basically decentralized timepieces that track energy and information. We call that entropy, you know, for people who have a physics bet. And obviously I do. So there are only two decentralized systems in nature. One is Bitcoin. The other one that's created by evolution is circadian control of the cell. So for me, in around 2013, 2014, I realized that Bitcoin was an information ledger that acts as a monetary clock for time and value. So of course I was very, very interested. So I jumped down the rabbit hole even further because I thought between 2009 and 2013, I was scared off by the flood that was going on, especially with Mt. Gox. And at that time, Bitstamp, which is still, I think, to this very day, the oldest exchange that's out there, I was able to purchase, you know, my initial Bitcoin back at that time. Mm. I'll be the first one to tell you that I I didn't know my head from my my asshole at that time. (laughs) Did I realize, because I had this belief that you learn about quantum biology by playing in that sandbox. And I felt the same way about Bitcoin. You can't learn about it until you physically own it. And when you own it, then and only then that you get it. And, you know, the other thing that I think is important for probably you to hear and probably your listeners to hear is that 
all clocks in nature, all the circadian clocks, only work by a proof of work mechanism. So, for example, hemoglobin in you is also a clock. Chlorophyll in plants is also a clock. Why? Because it slows light down from the sun and creates things in it. If you know anything about physics, e equals mc squared. If you look at it, anytime you slow light down, that's why it's c squared, you create things with mass. And that offends people when they first hear it. But then I explain to you, you know, you're in, in Melbourne now. If you don't believe me, you can go out and hit your head on a tree. And the tree is pretty hard. But if I told you that it's made out of complete nothing, you would argue with me until you realize that I'm right. It's CO2 mm -hmm. and water plus sunlight. That's mm -hmm. functionally what a tree is. Wow. And when you begin to see this, you begin to put this stuff together and you begin to realize that a clock, no matter what is out there from the physics perspective, and is something that undergoes irreversible changes. And it turns out, the key to an accurate clock in biology is having a lot more atoms in there because this clock that's in our eyes is an optical lattice clock. You're, some of your listeners are probably looking at me on the screen wondering why I have these funny glasses on and red light. Well, you're in Australia and it's nighttime here. Nighttime, I don't use any artificial light at night. Now I have to so that you can see me. Mm. So the best choice of light to use is LED red light. Why? Because LED red light is the most dominant part of sunlight. It's 43% of the sun, wow. but I don't want to have anything else around because it can lead to problems. And when you begin to understand Bitcoin the way I understand it, because I can tell you, I, I've not met anybody that's come to Bitcoin like I did from mm. the thermodynamic argument. Mm. You know, I'll give you an example because I don't know, I don't know how facile you are with medicine, but you probably heard of thyroid hormone. You know, it comes mm -hmm. in two versions, T3 and T4. Mm -hmm. So remember I told you before about the clock in us, higher life forms, you know, from when the Cambrian explosion started 650 million years to now, our clock is much more complex than it was 650 million years ago when we innovated the first forms of life from the Cambrian explosion. But here's the funny thing. This periodicity thing is big for Bitcoin. It's big for you. Why? Because the more regular a clock ticks, the more accurate the clock is. So this is the reason why the hash rate in Bitcoin, it simulates or mimics hmm. the metabolic rate of a cell or the body in the Bitcoin network. And, you know, we all know that Bitcoin's down right now, but we also know that the hash rate right now is through the roof. So what does that tell you? If you're just a guy that his number go up, you don't have the idea that Bitcoin at 16 or 17 is a screaming buy now because... Hmm. The hash rate is through the roof. You know, mm -hmm. we just had the biggest, you know, difficulty adjustment down. And again, what does the difficulty adjustment mean for us? It actually makes our clock in the Bitcoin network more, have more periodicity. It becomes more accurate for value and time. Satoshi Nakamoto built that into the algorithm. So I think about hash rate like the T3 hormone in patients. Mm -hmm. And I explain to my patients this idea, and then they begin to really, really understand what's going on because I explain to them what T3 is functionally doing in your central retinal pathways. It's actually making the clock in your eye far more accurate. And that's actually part of the reason why I've got red light on me and wearing blue blocking glasses. Mm. So I don't want anybody, you guys, to think I'm crazy. <laughs> well, to be honest, after such an an eloquent and well-researched and just based response. No one's going to be questioning that in the slightest, Dr. Dr. Cruz. That's an incredible insight. Thank you so much for sharing. There no are problem. some there are some subjects that you touched on that I'm completely underinformed in, and and as will most of my listeners, I imagine. So I might, if you will, dig around in some kind of basic question. But what I take away from hearing that is something that I love from this podcast is. I speak to people in different parts of the world. So it's decentralized in that sense. Like who are these different people? They're in different geographic locations. One, two, different age, three, different sex, four, different educational background. There's just so many different things about them. And what I look for that I picked up doing some angel investing a few years ago is you're in an early stage equity investor, you're buying someone's career in some sense, but also you're just investing in people. And it's just all about understand who is it why are they motivated? What's exciting about them? And so when I look at the potential of Bitcoin and I hear someone like yourself with the pedigree of background that you have, come and explain those things to me. 
in a way that no one else has done before in now what's been 50 conversations. Powerful stuff. It That's really is. It's amazing, isn't it? On, on a day-to-day basis, like what does a neurosurgeon actually do? In very much like a layman's sense. So what well, illness will I come to you with that you would help me with? We take care of illnesses in the central and peripheral nervous system. What does central mean? Brain. Peripheral nervous system is spinal cord, nerve roots, and nerves in the body. We do other things too. We do pain procedures. I don't do those, but the field of neurosurgery is wide. And usually within the field of neurosurgery, you have a specialty of of what you really, you know, focus in on. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I was younger, I did mostly complex spine surgery. Now that I'm older, I'm actually doing- Sorry, you said complex, you said complex spine Spine. surgery. Wow. Yeah. You know, so like, for example, if somebody- gets an injury and they potentially could be paralyzed. You're trying to do things to wow. keep them from becoming paralyzed or Rx, trauma, blood clots in the brain, things like that. Mm-hmm. And so to, to go like almost further back than that, did you know that you always wanted to be in medicine and be a surgeon? How did you end yeah. up in the space in the first place? Yeah, well, when I was four years old, I lived in New York City and I was playing with my matchbox cars and I fell off the couch and hit my chin right here. And my mom took me to the doctor who actually sewed me up with no local anesthetic. And I made my mom take out her mirror compact so I could watch it. Wow. And I told, told my mom that day, I said, I'm going to do this when I get, get older. And wow. you know, how most kids always, you know, want to do 19 different jobs. Mm. I never, I never varied in what I wanted to do. How cool. And so what would be some of the biggest challenges on, in the process of becoming a neurosurgeon and during that process, like, how does it actually feel to see a body lying in front of you? And you're like, oh, my God, I've got to do something about this. Like, how do you go through that? What must be an well, extraordinary decision making process? Like, it's, it's okay. actually not as bad as you think. And I'll okay. tell you the reason why. One of the key things about neurosurgery is that you learn very early on. I would tell you, actually, medical school, it starts because you're, if you have too much empathy, well, mm-hmm. this is going to come off sounding really bad, but I think when I no, well, hammer like the hear, point home, like, what's the reality of it? That's what I'm Well, the, rea- the reality is you don't want me being emotional about taking care of your brain tumor or your blood clot. Yes. It, to me, it's a, it's a job. It's a task. I have to go in there and complete the task as safely as possible. And I have to use the precaution principle when I do it. So for example, I'm taught or I was taught 30, 35 years ago in medical school and residency to think six steps ahead of before I did anything. Now, I will tell you that makes neurosurgery very different than just about every surgical specialty. Why? Because one, two, three millimeter mistake can lead to drastic complications for the patient. So the precaution principle is a huge factor. And like when I teach people about Bitcoin and Clubhouse, Mm -hmm. I always tell them that irrespective of where you are, what country you are, you know, what's going on with the macro situation, owning Bitcoin is employing the precaution principle for your value and your finance. So in that way, that's another facet that neurosurgery is the same, but you do not want your neurosurgeon emotional Mm. when they're going to operate on you. You have to actually train yourself for it not to bother you. And to be honest with you, there's collateral effects to that. I will tell you that my family will tell you this is one of the bad things about me because I will say and do things where other people are just, you know, appalled, but they don't realize the reason why I feel this way is because of how I was trained to think, you mm-hmm. know, in the beginning. And, and it spills over, you know, in your regular life. Of course. Uh, there's, of no, course. there's no question that it does. And you try to catch yourself, but yeah. a lot of times, you know, you don't. And what would be an example of it spilling over into your personal life? My daughter just had her birthday yesterday. Mm. My, I've probably missed over 20 or 25 birthdays. Wow. So, you know, on the surface, that sounds really bad. But the reason I missed the birthdays wasn't because I didn't like my daughter. It's because I was always on trauma call, mm. you know, when she was little. Or, for example, you know, working on holidays. I, I always had to work on holidays, you know. People, people mm. do stupid shit all the time. And unfortunately, we're the specialty that takes care of a lot of the stupid people, mm. you know, because they get themselves in trouble. So from that standpoint, you know, you have a job to do and that's your focus. But when you get older, like where I am now, I will tell you that 
things have changed for me. Like some of the situations that I'm in now, like I would have operated on. Like I'll give you an example. This this happened about six weeks ago. I had a guy come in, his wife shot him in the head for some bullshit reason. And I could have operated on the guy and saved his life. But the problem was the level of damage to his brain probably would have left him as a vegetable. Mm. So I had to discuss that with his mother and father, because remember the wife is the next kid, but because she was in jail, no one mm. cares what she thinks. Mm. So his mom and dad had to have this laid out and discuss with them. I can tell you 20, 25 years ago, I would have operated on that guy. I probably wouldn't have talked to them very much. Why? Because to do a gunshot in the head would make me quite a bit of money. Hmm. And it's actually really low risk because, you know, the guy got shot in the head. He is what he is. And that's it. This time, it's a little bit different. You, you have to, when you have a, a depth of experience and you've seen as many of these injuries that I have, you have a duty, you know, to the, not only the patient, but also the, the family. And I told them, I said, if you want me to operate on my will. And I will save his life, but I don't think you're going to like what you're going to get back. Mm. And I said, you need to know that. And I said, the flip side of that is if you don't do anything, he's likely going to die in the next 24 hours. Mm. You could donate his organs and you could change eight or nine people's lives. And guess what? That's what they chose. So uh -huh. the cool uh -huh. thing about my job is, you know, about three or four months from now, I'll get letters on where this guy's organs all went about the patients who got him. Mm. And unfortunately, they don't share that information with the family. I've always felt that they should, but it's a very powerful story to know that, you know, from a tragedy that you could still create a silver lining. And in a lot of ways, I feel, I feel the same way about, you know, Bitcoin. It may sound callous to say that, but I actually think all the stuff that's gone on with FTX and the things going on right now, like with Celsius, mm. it clears the deck of all the shit coins. And ultimately, that's that's actually a good thing. It's like getting rid of the brush under the tree so that we don't have big forest fires. Mm. Now, obviously, if you own a shit ton of Ethereum or Dogecoin or, you know, wrapped Bitcoin, you're probably crying, mm. you know, because of what Sam Bankman-Fried and, and Mashinsky did. But I don't look at it like that. They're, they're like the ultimate tuition fees in some ways. Correct. Before we before we jump into the kind of the shitcoin casino discussion, which I do enjoy, I'm I'm intrigued by a few things you've mentioned. Um, specifically this idea of the precautionary principle. So let's just dive into what that means in relation to Bitcoin. So why is oh. it that Bitcoin is the precautionary principle? You're you're probably going to get upset with me here, but I got a better, I got a better example, and it's actually from oh, your please. country. Please, no, no, go for it. COVID vaccine is a perfect example. We created this messenger RNA vaccine very quickly. We applied it to people without proper testing. We're now seeing huge problems with it all over the world in terms of, you know, higher death rates and people that got the injection and also mm -hmm. problems with blood clots and things like that. Mm -hmm. If we would have used the precaution principle like we do just about every other time in medicine, we probably, you know, could have offset some of the things that we're dealing with now. And ultimately, the prescription which was the shot, really didn't do what it was intended to do anyway. Because if you get the shot, you end up getting more COVID. You know, mm -hmm. we know that from the data. You know, the aftermarket data now is out. It's two years out. If I had said this to you it's in Australia two years ago. What's coming through, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, guy, there's a guy on Twitter. I don't know if you follow him, but you should. His name's The Ethical Skeptic, and he's a, a national security guy for the Navy. And he has done yeoman duty. And during the COVID thing, I, I did a couple of movies about mm -hmm. this issue and talked about the precautionary principle. And I told people, I said, I'm not really against vaccination. I'm just against this vaccine. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is this vaccine didn't have any of the testing that needed to be done. And I became very irate when they started to use it on young, healthy people, which mm -hmm. was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the best that's the best example of the precaution principle. Why? Because we all lived through it the last two or three years. Yeah. Now, when it comes to Bitcoin, I think, you know, if you consider what's gone on with the Australian currency, mm -hmm. uh, you guys have lost 40, 50 percent of the value of your money, mm -hmm. you know, with inflation and, and debasement. Mm -hmm. The only way for you to maintain that over time is to convert your fiat 
into Bitcoin and then sit on it. And the problem is you have to have the gumption to know that you're doing the right thing because, you know, Bitcoin went from 69,000 to 16. So I'm sure there's some people in Australia going, dude, but I got news for you. Three or four years from now, you're going to get your 40, 50, 60 percent back. Why? Hmm. This Bitcoin grows between 200 and, two, and 230 percent. And we're at we're not even in the first inning or since you're from Australia, we're, we're in the beginning of the soccer game hmm. or the beginning of the rugby game. Hmm. We haven't even bothered to take off. So hmm. the precaution pencil will tell you if you really understand value, time and information. The decision to convert your bad fiat to Bitcoin absolutely makes a lot of sense. And it's based on the precaution principle. Yeah, Plus, it gives you freedom back. I mean, your country it's has so, done things. It's so connected, isn't it? Well, it actually, is. so, so Dr. Cruz, I, I grew up in the UK and my wife is Australian. So I'm British living in Australia and I moved Same here. deal, dude. Same deal. Same, same deal. Same I mean, deal. The UK, I'm not UK suggesting is, the UK is any better, but... Just to share a bit about myself. So I haven't been back to the UK for three years. I have two little babies. I chose not to get vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccine. And we were unable to leave our house, leave leave the country. We couldn't travel. It was just extraordinary what happened here. Crazy. Yeah. And well, what, I have a lot of members on my website that are from Australia and also from really? the UK. Oh. So I can tell you that I know it was grim. the stories. In fact, one of the ladies who's, I think she's like 75 years old. She mm. left everything in Australia, picked up, and moved to El Salvador mm. about seven months ago. Wow. And she was very, very nervous about doing it. Yeah. But I told her even then, just like I'm telling you now, I said, Audrey, this is the precaution principle. You're not going to live probably another 20, 30 years. Mm. But I, I will tell you this. You're going to live free in El Salvador, mm. and you're going to be able to have your money. I said, I don't believe the same thing is true mm. for the next 20 years in Australia. I certainly don't believe it in, in continental Europe. Mm. Uh, and I totally agree with you, Dr. Cruz. Totally agree. There's, there's a number of my guests who are Australian but are no longer based in Australia that I've had, for example, that have gone, no, I've had enough. And one of them described Australia as a digital gulag. He said, they'll make it just nice enough that you don't quite realize it's that bad. You know, for example, so these Australian it's rules the boiling, football boiling, is... boiling the frog analogy. Yes, it is. The, the Australian rules football here is just huge. And I only learned about the sport on moving to the country. But of course, it was allowed to carry on when everyone was not allowed to leave their house. So like, you know, the whole bread and circuses comments. I love that gladiator scene, if you remember that movie. And, you know, they talk so openly about just give the plebs a good set of games and that'll just distract them enough to, you know, do what you want in the background. And it's the same concept, but real. And I couldn't believe it. Like we were locked up in our homes in Melbourne and the final of the AFL happens in Perth. And, you know, they get up Perth. Everyone was in the stadium, you know, because they had very strict rules entering West Australia. But they were able to stand up and sing the national anthem, which has a phrase about being young and free. And you're like, what is going on here? I'm not allowed to leave my front door. Yeah. Right. In the same country, you're having this televised event. Like this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And actually what it spurred me on to do was I've actually sold all my real estate. So I owned a house here and I was like, fuck that. I'm never, ever again being stuck in someone else's jurisdiction. And I moved the majority of that value into Bitcoin and kept the rest in cash. I fully intend on having multiple passports when that eventually happens. And this whole concept of jurisdictional arbitrage is fascinating. Like go where you're treated best. And that's the only way, like the, the, the absolute time that need Rand's to take joint. You He's need to take a trip back to, in. You're just like, you, whoa, who does this stuff? Well, you need to take a trip to El Salvador, and I don't think you'll stay too long really? in uh, Australia. I'm not kidding. Did, I mean, have I, you done I, some trips I, down I a, there? Oh, yeah, I own a house down there. Wicked. I bought, I bought a house down there uh, two months before the, the legal tender law. Okay, so teach us about that. So where are you based in the States at the moment, if you're willing to share? And Yeah, what right is now the, I'm in What is, right the, now, what is the rationale for buying a place in, in El Salvador? Well, I want to exit. It's just what you said. Okay. You got your exit. You went from the fire to the frying pan by going yeah. to UK to Australia. Yeah. I need I need a place that gives me total freedom. Well, Bitcoin is freedom of money. Yep. So the place that made it legal tender is El Salvador. They've had huge changes yeah, in the last crazy. two years. Yeah. And and the people there are absolutely embracing it. Like people who don't understand, like there's a lot of Bitcoin maxis out there that I deal with. You think 
that because when legal tender law was made, it was at 43,000. Now that it's at 16, nobody gets it. What they fail to realize is that El Salvador has a GDP of $28 billion. It's now, since legal tender, their GDP is 10% a year. In other words, they're growing like crazy. So that means every year, so for mm. the last two years, mm. the, the government has gotten $2.8 billion. What did the government do? It cleaned up the streets, got rid of all the criminals, and rebuilt the streets and rebuilt the whole country. And I've seen this go on with my own two eyes. I can tell you that the airport in San Salvador is nicer than the airport here in the United States. And it was all built in the last two years wow. with money from people coming to visit. And yeah. if you go down there, you'll see everything being built. You go to El Zante, Atami, Sun's mm. Out, you won't believe wow. it. I'd love to go and check it out because I, I saw some very, very simple stats. Like, let's say legal tender was the trigger for this, but the tourist industry in El Salvador has seen growth like nowhere well, else in the world. That's, right? that's what's and supporting that's, it. Correct. If you go, if you go to, if you go to El Zante, what the first thing you're going to know when you go to like the Bitcoin Beach, you're going to notice that there's a bunch of young people mm -hmm. that are all over the world. I will tell you, I've seen more Australians in El Salvador in the last two years <laughs> than anybody else. Canadians, yeah, and then believe it or not, tons of people from Europe now. Why? Because yeah. things have gotten so bad, you know, like with the macro standpoint with energy. Oh, it's crazy. People are like, they're like, look, I, I don't want to deal with this. Yeah. And you don't have to deal with that at the 13th latitude. Mm -hmm. You don't need to worry about energy. You can go to the beach and go swimming. Mm -hmm. You just may need air conditioning, you know, but most of the places down there have it. It's also very cheap to live. And because Bitcoin is driving this, you would think, because, you know, in most emerging markets, when inflation is out of control, emerging markets, the last place you want to go, collapse. Yeah. This, this breaks the rule. Mm -hmm. El Salvador is doing spectacular. Mm -hmm. And, the people that argue with me about this in, in the Bitcoin community, the Maxis, none of them have ever stepped foot in El Salvador. Yeah. So I'm like, it's kind of like, why would I ever listen to somebody who has no skin in the game? Because they don't understand functionally what's going on. Because really, mm -hmm. this is a movement about freedom. That's, I mean, mm -hmm. that's what decentralization from the Bitcoin standpoint, it's not just value. Mm -hmm. It's also about freedom, liberty, and the life to choose what you want to do so that way you can take the value that you've created over your life and save it mm. it's so interesting isn't it and this whole idea of the the system that we were born into this kind of fiat system whether you're in the states or australia or the uk in these examples i'm giving now there is now a new system and the, the old system is is failing and failing faster and faster as every year goes by and most people know something's up with the money but they haven't dug into why and if they did they'd be on this call as well right we're definitely well, i think the, I think the reason why sense. i think the reason why though is if you look at it in most western places I, I would actually say every place in the world financial education is terrible and the reason it's terrible because yep. the government wants to keep you an obedient idiot they want to make you a slave it's kind of like plato's allegory of the cave if you don't understand really what they're doing they're going to be able to harvest your money and value and you're going to be that slave in the cave that doesn't want to go out. And, and they're going to continue to feed mm -hmm. off you just like a vampire does. Why? Mm -hmm. Because if you understand truly what's going on at the end of this debt cycle and why we're failing in inflation, this is the reason why inflation and interest rates are staying up. Because if you have high inflation, high interest rates and unemployment, what does that do? It's great for the government that's in debt up to their eyeballs mm -hmm. because then they can create some value and lower the debt to GDP ratio. It's not rocket science. It's basic macroeconomics 101. But the problem is the people that you probably are with in Australia, the people that I see in the States and El Salvador, they don't have the nuance to truly understand these macro things. You know, mm -hmm. And it gets really interesting when you talk to people about currency because the FX market is really where you see this. Like That's why I mentioned in your case, You've seen it in Australia. I guarantee you some of your family in the UK when mm -hmm. all that guilt stuff went, that probably scared the shit out of them. But this is what people don't realize. There's no margin of safety in that. You know, and we talked earlier about the shit coins. My opinion is the number one shit coin is fiat. It's mm -hmm. not Ethereum. It's yeah. actually fiat money. And yeah. if your life is denominated in fiat, you are subject to their whims. 
to the World Economic Forum's ideas, to yeah. you know NATO. Mm. Uh, I, I think UN, like all of these right. huge internet, the WHO, like who the fuck right. are these guys? Well, yeah. the, these are the, the guys IMF, where we like these, these are the guys. These are the guys where we got a lot of the COVID vaccines mm. because I've told people that COVID was a compliance test for the economic reset, mm. and it's it's very counterintuitive for people to put that together. But when they limit what you can do, remember. You can't leave Australia. You just said it to your listeners here. Well, there's yeah. a reason for that because they want to feed off. You. They want to make well, sure that they can continue to harvest all mm -hmm. your tax money so they can pay down their debt. So, of course, they don't want you to leave. And the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is you can put all your value with 12 seed words in your head and leave. get on a plane and go wherever the hell you want. Yeah. yeah. They can't now. stop. So, so I, I think it's quite fun to share in a way. So I've just had my second baby girl who's three months old. So I have a two-year-old and a three-month-old and perhaps plans to have a, a third baby as well. And we feel very secure here in Australia from a kind of young baby's perspective. And that's one of the things that keeps us here. And equally, this, this concept of like being close to your family isn't that you know, worth value. And I, I haven't yet got to a stage where we've fully decided to leave, but I'm very, 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 very interested in this subject. And you, um, you won't like my advice here. I, I, I will tell you that I think you're selling yourself a bill of goods. I, I don't think that you can stay and start a family in a place that basically is an economic concentration camp. Brilliant. I think you're explain, I think you're well, I don't the think economic it makes any concentration sense. camp. What a what a it great. is. Yes, but it's the truth. I mean, think about the Germans from I don't know 1924 through 1935. You know, and what happened with the Treaty of Versailles. Mm. They felt like they were in an economic concentration camp, and yeah. part of the reason nationalism and Hitler came is because he reversed that trend. Yeah, but you don't ultimately want to be in a place like that. And here's the crazy thing: you know, Morrison, where you are down in in South Australia. Yeah. I mean, and the lady, I forget what her name is, but I remember she's the one that got busted for getting paid off from Pfizer. Yeah. They made decisions to keep you guys locked down compared to everybody else. Like if you were in Queensland, you didn't have the same rules yeah. of engagement. Well, tell me how that's, that's cool yeah. in a country that's supposed nice. to be a democracy. It's mad. It's nuts. Yeah. So, so I'm based you're, in Victoria you're telling me, and that was different to New South Wales, which was different to Queensland. And all of these correct. state premiers had all these powers and the prime minister who was supposed to be the democratically elected guy at the top did nothing about it. Just no, happily. And he's not going to do about it. Why? Because he's taken his marching, marching orders from yeah. the people in the World Economic Forum. You got to remember your history. This is why you're an interesting cat to me. You're a UK guy. Remember, you're in the Commonwealth. That's the, basically what's going on in Australia is the same shit that's been going on with the Bank of England forever. Yeah. I mean, that's a colony of the UK. Yeah. They want to go back to feudal times. Now, yeah. it's totally different. It's no longer like, okay, the king has got Buckingham Palace and everybody's working the fields. It's a little bit different, but it's not that different. No. And when I hear a guy like you who says, yeah, I want to have another baby and stay here, you're actually saying to me, the allegory of the cave, here, put wow. the cuffs on me and let me stay because I think it's going to be okay. That's the same probably as the German people who yeah. all of a sudden realized in 1938, 39, maybe this isn't a good gig. Maybe mm. we got a big problem here. Mm. So yeah, I would totally funny, disagree with you. Okay, brilliant. And, and that's what I love about this. It's about debate. It's about understanding different points of view and opinions and, and getting information and actually then you know, changing your mind is an incredibly important superpower. Like You have to be able to do that. And if you don't, then we're all fucked, frankly. Gosh, how interesting. And so to, to slightly change track, I'd like to rewind. You mentioned 20 years ago, you realized you had to make a change in terms of your approach to medicine. We've touched on a few conversations here around, you know, public health policy being more important than individual choice. Like that for me is the main thing that came through from COVID. It's like, no, you need to shut up and just do what you're told because we've got your back and we're in charge. And it's so like, I would, I, would actually, I would disagree with you. I would say that your choice is more important than public. I totally you agree with to, that. You Individual have to know. choice is what much more important than public right. health policy. And, but people would and, say to you, the public health policy is more important than individual choice. That's I'm what like, centralized no. medicine says. Correct. And that's what I'm so saying. How decentralized that medicine. connected to your decision 20 years ago? Like what? Uh, yeah. Why, it, why it, that? It happened? was about, well, it's about medicine. It's because when I was doing all the things I was trained to do, I realized that a lot of people weren't getting better from the things that I was told was right. And that caused me to start to question 
the paradigm. And then when I questioned the paradigm, I started to realize who this was good for. It was good for the centralized healthcare system. Wow. It was good for me too. I made money doing it, but you know who it wasn't good for? It wasn't good for patients. And that's actually the impetus that got me to start to question the paradigm. And that's why I said to you, it makes me a little bit different cat than probably most other people. And it's also the reason why as a boomer, I'm much more adaptable than probably other boomers because of my experience in medicine. Mm. I realized that if you keep doing the same shit over and over again, expect a different result, that's insanity. I mean, Einstein taught that, mm. but nothing is more true than with money because we're now at the end of a debt cycle. I don't know how many of your listeners have family members that experienced the last debt cycle, but I still have family members that did. Mm. And they taught me the lessons. I'm not willing to make the mistakes that they made last time. I've learned from their experience. That's part of the reason why I was kind of passionate about telling you, no, don't have the third baby. Don't, and if you're going to have it, don't have it in Australia. Mm. You need to get your passports. You need to get out of there. No, I don't think it's about your family. You know the reason why? Who are you good for if you're not good enough for yourself? So if you're making decisions based on everybody else, guess what? Mom, grandma, aunts and uncles, they can come visit you where you have your freedom, where you're teaching your babies that they should never trade liberty, freedom for security, ever. I love it. This is a very influential conversation we're having. It's very important for me to reflect on what you're saying. And you're absolutely right. There shouldn't be a trade-off. That's what's so fascinating about what Bitcoin is. Like These are questions that have been asked for so long. And for whatever reason, the life journey I'd been on, I hadn't asked them. And well, COVID, you, was like me, a, COVID was like a bus, right? It just hit you in the face. You're like, let me I'm give not, you, let I'm me not give in control you, of anything here. Like, Let me give you yeah, a, go, please. a quick history lesson. You'll probably like this since you're British. You have to realize we're the Stafford stepchild for you guys. Remember, yeah, we decided States, to revolt. Yeah. We decided to revolt against King George. Why? Because it was about taxation without representation. There was a lot of other things, the Stamp Act and everything else. But ultimately, those people made a decision to go somewhere else to start a new life. But here's the interesting thing, because I don't think you'll know this. The Federalist Papers, who were written by James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, basically said, that And they described the biggest problem with England was how the banking system controlled the crown and the people. Mm -hmm. And there was no Bitcoin technology at that time. But if you remember, mm -hmm. if you read the Federalist Papers for the people in the United States, Alexander Hamilton was on the opposite side. He was the first treasurer of the United States. Mm -hmm. He was very, very influential in us taking the model of the Bank of England. It's so funny. When I see, you know, on on in New York, in plays that they talk about Hamilton, Hamilton and Jefferson and Madison were diabolically opposite. Mm -hmm. And if Bitcoin had been available to the founding fathers, mm -hmm. Jefferson and Madison would have actually been Bitcoin maxes. Instead, we got Madison, and here's how it ended, my friend Jake. Aaron Burr, who was the vice president of Thomas Jefferson shot Alexander Hamilton and killed him. Wow. That's how big a deal this was mm -hmm. in the early United States. And you want to know something? Most Americans don't even know the story that I just told you, mm -hmm. that this was fundamentally about decentralization and centralization. Money. Why? Mm -hmm. Because people don't go back and read the original founding documents mm -hmm. about what they were arguing about. And I've always said that once you understand that, as an American, once you go back and realize why we fought against King George, and this is really going to probably be hard for you to hear, I feel that the guys that are in Washington, D.C. now are worse than what King George was in 1774. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't piss on them if they were on fire. In mm -hmm. fact, I think they're the biggest criminals mm -hmm. on the planet. Why? Because they are the leader of the centralized system. That's why it's the fiat money is the global reserve currency. And until that hegemony is destroyed, we're going we're gonna to continue to have these problems. So the precaution principle here is that you need to convert your shitcoin fiat into Bitcoin mm. and hodl and make sure 
that you know that you're doing the right thing. Correctly, and you teach your friends and family and all this stuff. Yes, I love it. So part of this Bitcoin rabbit hole inevitably takes you to a book called The Creature from Jekyll Island, which was absolutely brilliant. And through that, I understand a little bit about what you've just explained in terms of that historical story. And for those out there that are listening or watching and haven't read that book, go and do it. Yes, it's a big, long book. And a lot of it is like, holy shit, is this possible? Is this real? But what it details very nicely is the history of central banking and specifically like the Federal Reserve started basically 100 years ago. But they they tried a couple of times before that to actually get a central bank going. And there was a very, very big discussion in America about why it was important central banks didn't exist. And you just you, you can't find this stuff out in day to day media. You've got to dig it up, go and read about it. You touched earlier on about, you know, what life was like in Germany at certain times after the Treaty of Versailles. Another book, When Money Dies, go and read it. It's incredibly insightful. Um, are we in a similar time now? Yes. Yes, we absolutely are. I actually and think we're far worse because far worse. The, okay, debt, interesting. The, the, debt, the debt levels that we have now are 100x what they were then. And that doesn't even talk about the derivative market, like mm. where we are, like to yeah, the try Euro to make this. Market's just absolutely well, ginormous. I'm talking about. I'm talking about your country, American. I mean, think, yeah. think about think about what UK just happened with good. the gilts. Yeah, but well, just think about what happened with the gilts. That's the perfect example where, if the Bank of England didn't step in, people would have lost their pensions. Yeah, I mean, I don't think people in the UK realized how fragile the system yep. really is. When well, especially Dr. Cruz, when you when you realize that inflation is still running at ten percent. And they're, and they're having to dive into the market and, and print more. That's yeah. absolutely nuts. But do you know well, what gets me? It's going to continue people, that way. People don't really understand inflation. They're like, oh, what does inflation mean? It's just been so well, it depends. conveniently inflation, forgotten, if that makes inflation, sense. Inflation, well, I would tell you, though, there's, it's a very, it's, there's a parallel here with medicine. The textbook definition in macro books or economic books for inflation isn't the type of inflation Mm-hmm. that we're seeing right now. This is the reason why, you know, Jerome Powell and many of the people in Europe made a huge mistake. Like I try to tell people this, the big mistake that's going on right now in Europe, we can print money to create value through rehypothecation, but we can't print hydrocarbons. Mm-hmm. And the perfect example is what you're seeing right now in Europe. You know, mm-hmm. if we get a couple of degrees C drop, you're going to see the power grid go off in Europe. And that's why you have Macron out there right now saying, Who's it taking advantage of this? Well, it's the United States and Biden. Why? Because of the liquid natural gas market. Well, you need to understand that the way capitalism works is when Germany made the decision 25 years ago with Gerhard Schroeder to go green and get rid of nuclear, this meant that you were wholly dependent on Russia. Mm. And if you didn't think that Russia was going to take advantage of this at some point, you are absolutely batshit crazy. Mm. And that's exactly... What's going on now? And you have to realize that when you hold a group of people hostage, that's exactly what the World Economic Forum and the EU central bankers are doing. Mm. They're creating it so you can't go anywhere because you're going to pay their debts off. They're going to keep inflation high. They're mm. going to keep unemployment high. Mm. And, and, and they're going to make sure that over a period of time that the debt comes down. So the debt to GDP ratio comes mm. back in line and then they can kick the can down the road. For another 40, 50 years. What does that mean? That's financial repression. Remember, Mm. that goes back to the allegory of the cave. You're the slave in the cave. Yeah, and that idea, it was actually Alex Svetsky, now I remember it, who who mentioned on the pod when I interviewed him about Australia being a digital gulag and being just livable. And and he's so right. And you're telling me you want to stay there. I I know. Isn't, Isn't that crazy? No. And I'm and I'm someone that's asking these questions even. It's like that's how deep the conditioning is. Even when you're asking these questions, you're still like somehow holding on to some kind of nuance. Like I've recently been watching the Soccer World Cup and you know, England are through to the quarterfinals. I'm excited about that. But it, just a massive distraction. Why do I care so much about this 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 nation states? Because I always have and my mates and I talk about it and we get pumped and you know, it's like a Oh, I don't know. It's it's so interesting, isn't it? So we've got another 10 minutes or so, Dr. Cruz. I'd love to understand your perspective on the future of healthcare in connection to decentralized money like Bitcoin. So what does it mean for you know day-to-day healthcare and the ability to have your own money, be your own bank, ask questions, and potentially receive advice from people from a more decentralized system where you're not, you know, like- You want to hire doctors. Like- you want to hire doctors that are decentralized. Like, in other words- 
who okay. take Bitcoin, who teach you about mitochondrial biology. I mean, ultimately, if you understand mitochondria, and I don't have to get into all the details with you, mm-hmm. mitochondria transform mm-hmm. light. So I'm going to make it so this is something you can wrap your head around. Mm-hmm. You know that an oil refinery takes a barrel of oil and makes 20 other things that you use in the economy. Your mitochondria does the same thing with light. It takes light in, cuts it up into all the Pink Floyd spectrum, but it creates things in your cell that you need to live your life. Okay. And you have to learn how to optimize that to stay away from centralized healthcare. Because mm-hmm. when you go to the NHS, you are absolutely bending over at their discretion. Yeah. When you go through public health care in Australia, you do the same thing. That's mm-hmm. why they've got everybody in Australia convinced that you need to stay out of the sun so you don't get melanoma. It's exactly mm-hmm. the opposite. Mm-hmm. If you stay out of the sun, the chances of you get melanoma go through the roof. Wow. Uh, but you never <laughs> get told that. And no one can explain it in Australia. Why? Because remember, they're all getting paid to make sure you slip sather and wear sunglasses, yeah. you know, even in the kids in school. Nobody mm-hmm. thought to ask the question, you know, what are the wild animals wear sunscreen? What other wild animals wear clothes? What other wild animals wear Coco Chanel sunglasses? Mm. And what are the implications of zoo animals, humans, mm. doing this? Mm. And that that actually is the whole point. When if, if you're a Bitcoiner and you understand the ethos of why you're doing it, for you to become a black swan mitochondria, meaning that you're going to go deep and reject the centralized premise. It's not about RNA and DNA. It's about how you transform energy. In other words, the engines in your cell, you want to optimize them. The, I call them the oil refinery. Mm-hmm. If you optimize the oil refinery, and I think most people from the UK would understand this. Why? Because they're getting killed in energy right now. Yeah. So if you can, if you can figure out how to be more thermodynamically efficient with the light you get, then you're going to have to rely on less solutions through the prescription pad or through the hospital or through, you know, the medical journals that you see on TV when you're watching, you know, for the financial press. Because here in the States, if you watch CNBC or Fox Business News, every other commercial is from Big Pharma. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I don't think you're allowed to advertise pharmaceuticals here in Australia or the UK like you are in the States. It's a whole different ballgame. Oh, you are in the States, yeah. Yeah, America's a different ballgame like that. But it it really interests me, this subject. So I recently had on on the pod a guy called Rob Brinded. And Rob used to be a a physiotherapist for, you know, high-profile soccer players in the UK, Chelsea Football Club, for example. He's gone heavily down the, the mitochondria hole latterly, and he's now focused on meditation and all sorts of other types of energy science. And it really is dovetailing very nicely with what you're explaining here as well and he uh-huh. looked even at ancient wisdom in, in chinese medicine etc and the idea of chi and how that is about energy flow and there's a yin and a yang and all this kind of stuff i was learning about recently um, and, and it's so interesting to me that there are people like yourself like rob who you could get healthcare services from that have adopted bitcoin in a meaningful way that are able to think outside of the paradigm that actually the centralized mindset, as you pointed out, is really interested in creating lots of customers and not really getting them healthy, getting them well. Correct. Um, Correct. And that's just retarded, right? Like, how can anyone have that statement put in front of them and say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to go to the NHS? But it's, Jake, it's Clap like you just said. NHS. Most, peop- Clap most people like- don't, don't, they don't even think to ask the question. See that? It's kind of like, think about, think about all the guests that you have on here or when you try to orange pull somebody. They don't think to ask the question about why their money is terrible. Like, mm. like Australians just took it in the shorts. Their money went down 40, 50%. You would think everybody in Australia would be like, why is this happening? Yeah. And, and when they realize it, they would be running to Bitcoin, but they're not. Mm. And they don't yeah. understand how this process is going to continue to enslave them. Mm. Um, and that's the real problem. And the government, is is banking on you listen to your mother-in-law and your mother and they are going to pull at your heartstrings mm. but remember what i told you who are you good for if you're not good for yourself remember you're the father of potentially three little ones mm. your duty if you choose to have children is to make sure that your children do better than you did and mm. you keeping him in the gulag and hopefully you won't get upset with me when I say this. That's equivalent to you jumping on a train to Auschwitz and saying, we'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Mm. Wow. That's how I feel. Yeah, fair enough. 
and thank you for sharing that. That's the whole point of these conversations is, is learning from each other and understanding you know, how important it is to, to ask questions and to be curious and to understand how someone comes to a conclusion. And you know that final comment you've made there, <gasps> you can't say that, would be the general reaction to almost anyone. It's like when, when the, the COVID lockdowns were happening here and I was describing them as concentration camps, you know, people were like, oh, you can't say that. It's like, okay, well, it's called medical segregation. Oh, you can't. You actually, say that. you actually like, must that's say That's what's it. going on. That's exactly right. what's happening, mate. I'm unvaccinated. I'm not allowed in the pub. I'm not allowed in the public library. I'm not allowed in the sports stadium. I'm not allowed to do fucking anything. You're like, being censored. What, what is this called? Let's right. call it what it is. So yeah, I'm I'm very much I'm I'm very open to frank and and direct commentary. This has been a more confronting conversation than I expected because <laughs> I'm still in that kind of like denial phase slightly of like yes okay i don't own any real estate any longer okay i bought more bitcoin it's been a big year for me in that sense in terms of how i'm changing everything and i've owned bitcoin since 2015 but the percentage of my net wealth is bitcoin has just completely altered in the last 24 months for all the reasons that we've discussed about freedom about ownership about taking responsibility about getting away from this inflationary trap that is kind of coaxing you along but just leeching off you like some kind of parasite but yet still, as you've well pointed out, there's this vestige of attachment to what you're born into, basically. Um, so still some work to be done. Oh, well, Dr. Cruz, that's probably a good place to end. Thank you so much for sharing this time with me. Where can people reach out and get in touch if they want to do so? Well, you can find me just about anywhere on social media. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, mm -hmm. Facebook, Dr. Jeff Cruz, K-R-U-S-E. I have a book out on Amazon called The Epipaleo RX. Mm -hmm. It's actually on Barnes & Noble's too. And I have a Patreon site, www.patreon.com, Jack Cruz. That's where I teach people all this mitochondrial decentralized medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, and believe it or not, in there, I have 40 Bitcoin blogs that actually get into more mm. uh, than some of the discussions that we had here. So some of your, uh, your listeners probably would be interested in some of the perspectives that I have. No, absolutely. And I'll, I'll dig those up and have a look through myself. Well, thank you so much for joining today. And I really appreciate your time. My last question, I should just to remind myself. So you bought a place in El Salvador. Where where did you do that? Like, where's the best spot to have a look at? So I'm going to be on Google straight away having a look at like, you know, well, where, it, where are Bitcoin I'm, is heading and, and what's the... What's almost the everybody's place? going to El Zante. That's, yeah. you know, Bitcoin Beach, but it's very, very expensive now. I would tell you looking at some of the other beach communities is good, but my favorite place is a place called Lake Coate Peca. It's actually a volcano. It's got a lake in it. It's absolutely spectacular. It's about an hour and a half away from the beaches, mm -hmm. but the beaches on the Pacific Ocean are, you will never want to go to Hawaii once you go to El Salvador. <laughs> awesome. It's very easy to get to, especially from the States. It's yeah. only about an hour and 45 minute flight from Houston. Yeah, brilliant. All right, well, Dr. Jack, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. All right, take care. It was nice meeting you. Okay, friends, nice work. You made it all the way to the end of the episode. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this conversation. As I said at the start, if you have any questions, then please don't hesitate to reach out. And if you enjoyed the episode, then please rate, like, subscribe, and share. That's it for now. Enjoy the rest of your day. All the best, Jake.